in Tehran. They're burning down the Saudi embassy. You see that. Now, what that is, is Iran wants to take over Saudi Arabia. They always have. They want the oil, okay? They've always wanted that. They have a bunch of dishonest people. They've created ISIS. Hillary Clinton created ISIS with Obama. My next guest poses a rather controversial hypothesis. He argues that the threat of ISIS is not as great as our politicians make it out to be. That we, the American people, have a higher probability of being shot by a policeman or struck by lightning than we have of being killed by radical jihadists. And he argues that no matter what precautions are taken, there will most likely always be homegrown terrorists who radicalize and try to commit attacks. And that by giving into fear and giving terrorism all the media coverage and attention that we do, we are becoming our own worst enemy. Here with me now to discuss his ideas on ISIS and America's fight to protect our nation is chairman of the Kilowin Group and senior advisor at Washington, D.C.'s Atlantic Council, Harlan Ullman. Harlan, welcome back. Nice to be with you and Happy New Year. Thank you. Same to you. News. Yes. Now, you recently wrote a column titled, We Have Met the Enemy and He Is Us. In that article, you talk about the obsessive fear with ISIS and with terrorism. But let's start with the title and the premise of the article. What do you mean when you say that we are the enemy? Uh, the problem is that we have a broken system of government. We have a presidential campaign that is a horrible caricature in which they are overselling the terror issues and overselling, overselling fear. The fact of the matter is, Americans are still very safe at home. That doesn't mean that the Islamic State is not an existential danger to the region or it's not a threat that we have to deal with. But the hype that's being put in place by politicians on both sides of the aisle, to me, is overly dramatic, unwarranted, and it really makes us the enemy. We need a cool, commonsensical approach to what we're doing. I don't think the administration is fully doing that yet, but certainly the likes of Donald Trump and others are hyping this up to a huge threat to scare Americans when, indeed, we should not be scared of the Islamic State as much as we should be afraid of some of these would-be politicians who really don't know what they're talking about. Now, in your article, you say the antidote to fear is fact and reason. Now, do you mean that we, the American people Absolutely. here at home, shouldn't fear ISIS because the probability of us getting attacked is so low compared to other ways we could die every day? Well, I put it a different way, Liz. I would say that Americans have to understand that they're very safe at home from the Islamic State today. We also have to realize that the Islamic State is a huge threat and that our government is not taking all the actions that it could be taking, even though most of those actions are not military. We've not been able to put together the coalition that we need. We've not been able to cut off funds. We've not been able to put together a propaganda war to destroy the ideology of what I call these Nazis with suicide vests. Uh, but having said that, uh, Americans should not be afraid of the Islamic State coming at them at their homes. That is not going to happen. Now, Americans, more importantly, are more insecure than they are afraid. When you take a look at the jobs picture, you take a look at wages, you take a look at declining infrastructure, Americans are less secure than they are than they were several years ago. But that's far different from being safe and being afraid of an Islamic threat, which is not going to be very, very real and is almost certainly not going to affect most Americans at home for a very, very long time. Right. What about the system of intelligent law enforcement that we have to detect and prevent these attacks domestically, not even outside the country, but here at home? Is that a good enough system within the United States? It's rather like the question is, can you prevent all crime? No. But we have spent hundreds of billions of dollars since September 11th on intelligent and law enforcement capabilities. And so I think in that regard, people are much safer today from terrorist threats. What about homegrown terrorists? What about radicals? Uh, think about 1995 when somebody called Timothy McVeigh blew up the Murrah building in Oklahoma City, killing 250 Americans. He was an American. He wasn't even a radical. Think about Major Hassan at Fort Hood in Texas. He was an Army psychiatrist. These things are going to happen just like school shootings and mall shootings are going to happen, and they're not going to be prevented. There may be an occasional terrorist attack. I understand that. But the fact of the matter is Americans are largely safe in their homes today. The biggest issue is making our government work so that the American people can be properly led and enabled to be able to have lives that are prosperous, safe, and secure. 
Government is not doing that. And quite frankly, looking at both campaigns, we're getting wild promises. We're getting ads that are based on fear. And we're getting a lot of policy suggestions that are just simply not going to work. So I think common sense and fact are essential. And I would ask each American, when they look at the person they're voting for, to take a very careful look at the policies to make sure that they pass the common sense test. And most of them, quite frankly, don't. Right. You talk about these terrorist attacks maybe being isolated, but a lot of them have been inspired, if not funded, and connected directly to ISIS. And we do have knowledge. Not really. No, 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 no. You disagree no, with the no, fact no, that they're no, inspired no, no, no. by We're ISIS? I mean, Major Hassan or the ones in San Bernardino are yes. certainly inspired by radical Islamic ideology. We're talking about a handful. We're not talking about dozens or hundreds. We're talking about three, four, or five. And even if you take a look at the total arrests that have been made that may have some connection, they are relatively small. Look, we have a population of over And should we just write that people. off, though? Or if there's something frankly, we can do to stop those to prevent not. that? We can't just write them off. We are. No, of course. Look, we are doing, we are doing about as much as, as feasible as we can without imposing too much on American civil liberties. But the point is, let us not panic. If you want to talk about times of panic, go back to after World War II just ended. 1946, 47, 48, 49. China became uh, communist in 1949. The Soviets got the bomb. There was the Berlin crisis. The world was just coming apart. Those were really frightful times when both sides had nuclear weapons, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Today, yes, we are worried about a handful of terrorist attacks, but we're also worried about attacks by violent criminals and other Americans who have done an awful lot of damage just through shootings of, um, of, of regular people. The point is that we have to have common sense. We can defeat the Islamic State, but we're not going to defeat it readily if we panic and we succumb to a lot of these fear merchants who are hyping the dangers and coming up with policies that are entirely unworkable, infeasible, and liable to do more damage than harm, than help. Right, if it's based off of emotion rather than on fact. Uh, let's shift topics for a moment and talk about Absolutely. the other effects that radical Islam has around the world. Uh, the Saudi government broke off diplomatic ties with Iran recently and gave Iranian diplomats two days to leave their country. This came after the Saudi government killed a leading Shiite cleric and nearly 50 others who they claimed yep. were terrorists. Uh, in response to this killing, protesters stormed the Saudi embassy in Tehran, uh, which prompted the Saudi government to sever yep. the ties with Iran. What do you think this conflict, or how do you think this conflict will impact the United States? Well, let me put it this way. It will not have a very positive conflict, uh, have a very positive consequence on the region. There are two critical issues here. First, the Islamic State has got to be stopped, and there has to be some kind of resolution of the civil war in Syria. But because you've got everybody on, every, on a different side, you've got Iran versus Saudi Arabia, the Russians involved, the Americans, et cetera, et cetera, uh, this uh, <clears throat> hissing competition between Tehran and Riyadh is, is not going to be particularly helpful. My sense is, however, that we may be making a little bit too much over this because it is not in the interest of either of Iran or Saudi Arabia to make this into a huge uh, fight to the death issue. Uh, they both are oil producing countries. Iran has almost as much oil as Saudi Arabia. It will not have the embargoes lifted on that oil until it complies with the joint <clears throat> uh, agreement on reducing their nuclear capacity. Uh, that's going to take some time. So there are reasons why there are some stabilizing events. But for the time being, this throws a monkey wrench into the uh, affairs and events that are ongoing. And one of the problems is, quite frankly, that American influence and prestige is not as strong as it used to be or it should be. So we are having probably more of a marginal role on trying to calm the situation than we could. But having said that, uh, just as the Turkish shootdown of the Russian jet just led to an exchange of nasty messages, I don't think that this uh, <clears throat> tiff between Iran and Saudi Arabia is going to lead to conflict. But I do think it's going to make the situation more dangerous. And unless or until we can concentrate on defeating the Islamic State, ending the civil war in Syria, and making sure that Iran does not ever, ever get nuclear weapons, those have got to be our priorities. And the degree that we can convince, coerce, or cajole Saudi Arabia and Iran that they have a huge stake in that, the better off we're going to be. All right, we're almost out of time, but let's talk about defeating ISIS quickly before you go. Now, you recently wrote another article yep. <clears throat> about Obama's strategy in defeating ISIS, and you say that it's not his strategy that's flawed so much as the premise behind his strategy, and his premise is that ISIS is a junior varsity team. Do you disagree with that premise? 
Absolutely. I think ISIS, the Islamic State, is a hugely dangerous threat. I also understand and appreciate the president's reluctance to get us thrust into what Winston Churchill called a volcano of Iraq. Uh, we've had a bad experience in Iraq before. We've had one in Afghanistan. But having said that, I think that the administration has failed to make as good a case as it can. It has failed, really, to put together an effective coalition of 60-odd states. It has not empowered our special envoy to that coalition to do enough things. It has not brought NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the most successful military alliance in history, into the fray. So, yes, there are a lot of things that need to be done that I would be critical of the administration for not doing, and I think it's something that needs to be done. We don't have to deploy large numbers of ground forces, but we certainly have to take the steps that I suggested if we are really going to defeat the Islamic State in some kind of an acceptable timetable. Yeah, I found, I found what you wrote about pretty interesting, the fact that you said it's the premise of his strategy, not the strategy itself, and that that's where uh, a lot of the Absolutely. conflict comes between Republicans and Democrats when we debate uh, Obama's strategy, whether or not it's effective, that it's not the strategy, it's the premise. And I think other people should go and check out your article because it's very worth the read. We are out of time for tonight. Harlan, I appreciate you coming on the program. Hope to talk to you soon.